Okay, I think we'll get started here. So good, good morning, everyone. My name's Kevin Simpson. I'm one of the co-founders of the Colorado Sun, uh, as well as a staff writer and the editor of Sun Lit, which is our weekly feature on Colorado connected authors and their work. You can check it out every Sunday. We have a new excerpt and an author interview. So please check it out. Um, now I want to thank you all for coming, especially those of you who are already Sun members, because you're the ones who keep us going with your support. It's much appreciated. So as you may have noticed, we tagged this event with a, a theme for a better Colorado. And that can be interpreted in a number of ways uh, among our panels throughout the day. But for this discussion of Ted Conover's excellent book, Chief Land Colorado, Off Gridders at America's Edge, I feel like it speaks to how the effort to understand others makes us all better. So we'll talk about that and a lot more as we get going here. So let's introduce our guests. First of all, Ted Conover grew up in Denver, repeatedly left Denver uh, for college, for graduate school, career pursuits, but he kept finding himself coming back. And that's what he did six years ago to begin researching uh, this project, this book. And this is just the latest in his distinguished career, which includes the book New Jack, Guarding Sing Sing, which was the winner of the National Book Critics Circle Award for nonfiction, as well as a Pulitzer Prize finalist. Uh, when he's not spending time in the San Luis Valley, he's a professor and former director of New York University's Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute. Thanks for joining us, Ted. Thanks, Kevin. So we're, we're also fortunate to have with us one of the people who actually appears in the book. Tonazian Raval, who also goes by Tona, is a sixth generation San Luis Valley resident. So you could say she knows the territory. And at the time that Ted was researching his book, uh, Tona was the director of a local shelter and provided guidance as Ted navigated the landscape, the culture, and the history of the vast area of the San Luis Valley known as the Flats. Now she works at the University of Denver providing technical assistance to schools in the San Luis Valley around funding to improve K-12 students' well-being. She lives in Las Mesitas, just a few miles west of Antonito in far southern Colorado. Welcome, Tona. So I'm going to take a seat here and we'll get started. So Ted, first of all, tell us about the, the genesis of this book uh, with the context of what was happening in America at the time this idea kind of formed in your head. I was living in New York, which is where I mostly live, and uh, had actually done a interview before the Republican presidential primary uh, with a French radio station about the prospects of the different Republican candidates. And at the end, they said, and they said, I hadn't brought up Donald Trump. And I said, no, I don't, I don't think there's any way uh, Donald Trump will become the nominee. And uh, uh, that was such a, a wake up call to me uh, about having fallen into a kind of silo of uh, journalists and um, people who didn't think Trump could become president. Probably, I have a, a bit of company, people in the room who might have thought that. Um, uh, but I started thinking uh, I really needed to do something outside of New York. And not long after, my sister who lives in Denver had uh, sent me a PDF of a visit to the Valley uh, she worked for the Gates Foundation and 
got a tour of the flats, the prairie area between the Sangre de Cristos and the San Juans that is the most of the land of the San Luis Valley, which uh, you know is about the size of New Jersey. It's a huge area. Uh, lots of people drive through and don't stop on their way to New Mexico from here, but uh, it's an amazing place. And she had photos, uh, some of them taken by the partner of Tona, who had worked in a La Puente initiative called Rural Outreach. So La Puente was uh, a social service organization based in Alamosa that began with a shelter. Uh, it was started by a nun and some other citizens to just try to keep people from freezing to death, basically, uh, in cold weather. And uh, they were seeing a lot of people around this time of year and in the next couple of months who were bailing out of their attempts to live off grid uh, in this vast, unsettled area between the mountain ranges. And uh, they decided it would be better for them and better for the shelter if some of them could stay put instead of having to leave their homes. So uh, they got a grant and uh, Robert Tona's partner was the first outreach uh, person and he would look for ways to connect people to their meds or, or to uh, fuel, um, propane or firewood or clothing, anything so they could stay put. Um, I didn't know people lived in little sheds in the middle of Colorado in, a, in the prairie. I, uh, I'd written for 5280 Magazine about South Park, where there are a few people living this way around Hartzell, a uh, similar sort of 70s subdivision into five-acre lots of these former giant ranches. Uh, the land uh, has really not appreciated over the years because there's so many lots in Castilla County which I mostly write about, there's 45,000 five-acre lots. And uh, a few have been lived on uh, over uh, in a sort of settled way. I'm sure they've been lived on for many, many years by tribal peoples passing through, but not in the sort of way we think of as off-grid today. And uh, But that was changing with the price of solar panels going down. and the price of housing elsewhere going up. And uh, so I got a look at it and uh, met with a fellow who had followed Robert in that role and uh, uh, talked to Tona in the shelter in Alamosa uh, just about who's out there. And uh, I asked if I could volunteer to help do that work too. So uh, maybe you talk a little bit about the, the title itself, which I think is, is interesting. Some of you may already know the, the story behind Chief Land Colorado. Uh, so maybe you could tell us a little about that. But also, uh, as I started looking at it a little more, uh, off-gridders at America's edge. I'm wondering, what, you, what did you mean by America's edge? Was that sort of cultural or? I'm just thinking uh, th this is, this is, uh, you know, I guess you could say we have edges uh, on the West Coast or the East Coast or the Gulf Coast, but this is a, a social edge of people of very low status, generally low income, uh, sort of off the radar of most people. Um, uh, yeah, just uh, marginal uh, in terms of how deep their resources are and in terms of how much they feel connected to the mainstream. So you meet a lot of sort of people with extreme ideas out there. Um, uh, you meet all kinds of people, frankly. Uh, people <laughs> growing marijuana, people recovering from PTSD, uh, people with addictions, people with outstanding warrants, uh, normal people too with uh, kids who uh, some are homeschooling. Um, uh, there's all kinds of people. So on, on some level, is, is this a story about communication and understanding? Because that was sort of a, a challenge for you. Well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and not just because I come from out of the valley. Uh, Tona will tell how hard it is to just drive up to somebody's property and start talking. That is 
a major challenge and possibly dangerous uh, <laughs> often. But there's a whole protocol. Would you like me to talk about that? No. Sure. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and then I want to get to Tona's idea of who these folks are, if we can. Right. So you, you don't drive right up to somebody's door. That's a terrible idea. Most people seem to be armed. And if they have a flag flying, they're almost certainly armed, um, I think. Uh, and uh, you are best to stop at the, where their driveway meets the dirt road and tap your horn and hope somebody responds. And if they don't, maybe tap again and step outside the truck. I had a truck with a La Puente magnetic door sign. So uh, if somebody, you know, you just look friendly. Are you, <laughs> if you're me, you step out so they can see you're not a dangerous looking person of great bulk or fearsomeness. And um, you just say, hey, uh, want to introduce myself. I'm with La Puente Rural Outreach. I can help you get some firewood. I can help with this and that. And maybe half the time people want to engage. Yeah. So uh, there's a passage about Tona earlier in the book that I, I think you wanted to share. This might be a good place to uh, kind of reintroduce Tona in terms of her role in the creation of this book. I would love to, because Tona taught me a lot. Um, the, the shelter, the La Puente shelter, is sort of the backstop for off-grid people. When they give up, they sometimes go to the shelter. Tona explained the direct link between the shelter and the off-gridders I was interested in. Quote, you're living in a slum, and you see an ad about owning five acres for $5,000, and you have a view of Blanca Peak. To them, it's an opportunity. It's the savage wild, their piece of the rock. People would come to the valley just to own their own place, free from landlords and utility bills, and free also from being judged. Quote, sometimes the attitude is, I'd rather live a rough life out there than live in town and be looked down on, Tona explained. This is from her office in the shelter. Regardless of if it's a stupid choice, it's their choice, she continued. But it wasn't always sustainable, because though they might be living on their own land, they still were poor, with slender margins for surviving if things went wrong. Often said Tona, they turned up at the shelter once it got cold, and they saw how unforgiving the winter could be. The most durable off-gridders often had a fixed income of some sort, veterans benefits, for example, or social security disability payments, because otherwise it was hard to make a living. The flats were far from jobs, and getting to jobs required reliable transportation, which many lacked. So Tona, uh, why don't you jump in here and tell us a little bit about living in, in the flats in, in the San Luis Valley. Uh, your family goes way back there. What are the distinctive traits that, that kind of set it apart? And, and you've got you know, these newcomers, and you also have people who are established, who've been there for generations. Tell us a little bit about the culture of the valley. Sure. Um, the valley um, founded, or, or, or settlers came to the valley many, many years ago. Um, and they lived in places that um, where they could grow things, where they had water, where they had access to different things. And so they homesteaded and they, you know, they built, they built these communities around those homesteads. Uh, the flats uh, is, is an area that wasn't populated and it's because there wasn't a lot of access to those things. There's not water there uh, for, for some of these people to drill a well. They have to drill several hundred feet, which is very expensive. So, so the people that um, have it, uh, inhabit the communities around the flats, they've been able to make make a life for themselves. They've been able to, you know, have um, a place to grow food. Um, they they have their little communities. The flats, on the other hand, is is just miles from anywhere. Um, people that are living out there sometimes don't want to have communities. There are small communities of people who want to, you know, work together to provide transportation or help each other out. But some of these people do not want that. So it's, it's, there's a vast difference between the communities that have been there for a long time, the people that have um, you know, uh, homesteaded and lived in the valley for a long time, and some of these newcomers that came out 
uh, to get away from wherever they were and try to make a life in this kind of unforgiving territory. So what, what's the relationship like between the longtime residents and the, these folks you, you describe? Uh, yeah, it, in the county where uh, most of the people in the flats live, there's, there's two counties, Alamosa and Costilla, but Costilla County is home to San Luis, which is the oldest, um, oldest town, is, is that what they call it? Oldest town in Colorado. And so these people have been there for generations. They're set in their cultures, they're set in their way, um, and they, they weren't big fans of having this um, big subdevelopment, if that's what you want to call it, um, happen. And so there's, there's a lot of friction between the people that live on the flats and the people that live in, these, in, in this community of San Luis or the smaller communities that surround that. And um, traditionally Hispanic um, population in San Luis and a lot of people that are living on the flats are not Hispanic. And so I think there's that, um, there's that friction in that way as well. So working at the shelter, um, as, as Ted was saying, you, you saw people who maybe had given up or were struggling and, and, and came in. Um, tell us a little bit about the, the types of people who cycled through there. Were they, were they always kind of the, the same types of folks or did you see a wide variety? We, we saw a wide variety. I think sometimes we'd have families that that had come through, they had perhaps started building something, maybe didn't have a, a, a house or a home that was well insulated, and so when the winter came, they would bring their kids and they would come to the shelter just you know, trying to get out of the cold. Sometimes we saw, um, I can remember a gentleman who lived somewhere out there who came in and was covered with soot. You know, He was a loner, he, I don't know. I never was really able to get exactly why he was covered in soot. He said his wood stove didn't work well, um, <laughs> but he would come in once every uh, you know every month or so to shower and, and you know get some food. We'd have people who um, veterans who suffered from PTSD and different different things like that who would come into the shelter. So a wide variety of people would come in to seek services sometimes to stay at the shelter, other times to be connected to the other services that La Puente offers. Well, and I, I think as, as Ted alluded to, that the weather is so unforgiving, uh, especially in the winter. Did, was there almost a cycle that you saw of, uh, you know, to, at a certain point, people would kind of reach their limit? Yeah, we, we, I remember one lady in particular came, she was an older lady, and every, you know, every December, around December she would come and she would stay at the shelter until you know January, February, March, as long as possible she would stay. And, and, and so we did have these people that came every single winter and would stay as long as we, you know, as we allowed them to, to, to get out of the cold. Um, Alamosa is typically the coldest spot in the nation a lot of winters. It, it, it gets to 20, 30 below there. Mm -hmm. So Ted, uh, why did you think this story could be not only interesting in and of itself, but also instructive? Uh, again, kind of going back to the context that you were talking about for the creation of this book. So I, I guess I've become interested in groups of people who I th think readers would like, and, and sort of maybe people I know would like to know more about if only it weren't so hard to learn. And that could include, um, you know, people who ride freight trains, which is the subject of my first book, or migrants from Mexico who we see on the news, but they're not easy to get to know as people if you live a different kind of life, or the people who work and serve time in prisons. And likewise, we read about this, but it's hard to know what that's like. and. Uh, so my approach for some time has been to find a world I can participate in, in a way, and uh, learn th through doing and not just through interviews. So interviews are still really important, and that's how I started out, out on the flats. I'd say, here's your wood. Um, by the way, I'm a writer. I live in New York. Uh, <laughs> I know, and then so that's like two strikes. Um, I'm a professor. Oh, it's three strikes. Uh, but no, people would actually. Um, s I think they're more inclined out there to take 
people one on one and just see who you are and what you're about. And my approach is I'm not the smart guy from the city here to teach you anything. I'm the ignorant guy who doesn't know how to stay warm in the winter or how you do it. How do you do it? How, how can you possibly stay warm in this tin can uh, where you live? I wouldn't say it this tin can, but uh, uh, that is what I was thinking. And people like to share their knowledge, and I think they're proud of surviving in a, in a difficult situation like that. They're proud of making do. And in fact, that is what they seek, I think, is autonomy and, um, and self-determination. And so if you're a listener, and you're willing to take your time, uh, you can get to know people. And uh, I thought this act of getting to know people unlike me, I'm just into it. Uh, but I find it also presents all kinds of good opportunities for storytelling because you know, things go wrong, uh, people misunderstand, uh, things happen. And there's a lot of drama out there, actually. Uh, Though it may be sort of far-flung people, like Tona was saying, uh, they know each other, at least by reputation, and often they know each other uh, by name and by Facebook, Facebook Messenger. Or by what their building looks like. Yes, by their place, by their vehicle. In fact, I would drive up for a cold call on a little settlement with dogs chained to the front, and kids' toys there, and I'd say, hey, I'm, I'm Ted from La Puente, and I'd say, oh, we know who you are, um, because th their neighbors had seen me all week long driving into abandoned uh, properties and waiting for somebody to appear. They found it kind of funny uh, <laughs> that I would <coughs> get, to, um, get to be there that way. So no, people knew about me already, and um, and then I decided, better than living in Alamosa, and initially I stayed with a friend of Tona's who had a free room, um, I, I ended up buying her trailer and then renting a piece of property from a family uh, that had five girls, they were homeschooling, and didn't mind the extra money from a guy. And they didn't mind the direct line to La Puente either, because I could bring food from the food bank. And, so anyway, then I got known to a wide variety of people. Fast forward to today, I ended up buying my own property uh, just because it's hard to be out there renting. You think, well, there's all this great, there's this amazing lot over here, and, or there's that one. And, um, and I waited till there was a property where I thought, I like the neighbor, and I liked it's, that makes a big difference. Um, <laughs> and, um, and there's somebody yeah, who would keep an eye out if I left something there when I went away. Because if you leave something of value, even a whole camper trailer, it'll, it might go away when you, when you do. Okay. Yeah. So you, you've done, obviously, books like this before, this immersive uh, approach. Did you know going in that buying land or renting land and you know, becoming a fixture there was going to be part of the equation, or did this all sort of happen organically? You know, at some point, I thought maybe I would. And in fact, I had an assignment from Harper's Magazine, and they wanted me just to buy a lot, a, a five-acre lot. And I said, and they were even going to pay for it. And I said, I cannot in good conscience pay money for a lot like this, which you will not be able to sell uh, when my work is done. This is the whole problem with investments out there, is there's no market. There's so many lots. And uh, so I didn't, I didn't buy property then. I wrote an article, and eventually I, I found a place I thought could be uh, a place I might have feelings for, not just as a thing to own, but a, 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 I, I go there now. I was there all week. I, I'm not, uh, I'm, I wrote the book, it's done, but I like going there. So that's what I was looking for. 
So, Tona, uh, I, I'm wondering from your vantage point, you're watching Ted go through this, uh, and you know the challenges uh, for people in the area accepting uh, not just a, a newcomer to the area, but a writer, someone who's going to chronicle a, a story, and and though a Colorado native, a, a New York City uh, resident, what what did you think about having this story told and how people would react to Ted? Because I imagine Ted saw the the direct interaction, but you might have heard some things, some conversations behind the scenes. <laughs> What's he talking about? <laughs> so so initially, you know, my thought was. Good luck, right? <laughs> Good luck. Um, <clears throat> but, but really, my work at La Puente Shelter, you know, th these people, even though, you know, they were living off grid, they were poor, they were sometimes dirty. They were, they were people that um, that I served at the shelter. Um, our organization served. My husband Robert was out there um, making sure that they weren't freezing to death and that they had enough food. And so they were they were people, right? They were. Um, worthy of just as much respect as anybody else in the world. And so for me, it was about, I knew that Ted would would honor that, that it wasn't going to be just a story for him. I knew that um, Ted could see the, the, the human part of, of, of the story. Um, and so I, I was confident that, that he would tell the story in a way that, um, you know, that, that brought the information out, but didn't didn't really do a disservice to the people that were were my um, you know my clients, the people that I was helping initially. And <clears throat> initially, that's how we how we learned about the people on the flats. As my husband and I um, went out to just count people for a for a, a survey that was happening, and then that um, kind of gave birth to the rural outreach. And so we were able to get to know a lot of these people. And so. You know, initially I thought, mm, I don't know if it'll work, but you know, Ted has that, he's got that sparkling personality and he, <laughs> he connected with the, with the people out there, I think, and, and, and um, was able to get their trust. And so, yeah. You, I just remembered, you connected me to the Gruber family. Yeah. Um, I was looking, I thought, oh, someone will have an extra room. I will rent a room. And it's not like that. There's no place to rent. Nobody wants a renter. No, uh, uh, but you thought, well, if you had your own trailer, if you could manage that, then maybe someone would tolerate you. Yeah, I mean, I, my husband Robert was the one who really said, "Hey, what about the Grubers? Yeah. You know, they they probably wouldn't mind having having someone, you know, uh, supplement their income just a little bit." And so, yeah, it was it worked out. So then the the question for me is about is this journalism because. Um, as a journalist, you know that traditionally you should not be paying rent to your source, right? <laughs> uh, most cases. <laughs> <laughs> in most cases, that's a problem. But, um, uh, and I started doing journalism at Manuel High School and at the Aurora Sentinel newspaper. And I uh, am proud of that kind of journalism. But I also started experimenting with the ways you can inform yourself as a journalist by going deeper and, and by writing about your experience. And so I think in particular, if you're writing about people with less, uh, fewer advantages, and there's a thing, there's something you can do to help instead of just ask, I think that's not a bad thing. And uh, as long as you're transparent about the ways your objectivity might be uh, compromised, and I think I am. Uh, um, yeah, I, I'm living with this family. I like them. Um, they tell me things. They, the mom talks about uh, the stigma of not having teeth and how everybody thinks she must have used meth. And um, she's making herself vulnerable to me. I'm not going to, I'm, you know, I'm. She's more than just a source. She's somebody I actually saw this week, and I, I've stayed in touch. So I, I kind of think there's room in nonfiction writing and in journalism to go deeper and get to know people and, and try to create relationships and write about that. So, Tono, I, I'm curious if there was a, a point 
uh, in your relationship with Ted when you sort of a tipping point where you felt comfortable in telling other people, yeah, he's okay, yeah, you, you could trust him, you could talk to him. Yeah, I mean, I think that was the moment that I took Ted out on the flats. Uh, my husband and I drove out there and I actually introduced him to people. I don't feel like I would have done that had I had, I had any hesitation about um, how he would do. And so I did that. We, you know, we drove out and drove up to some people's um, houses and said, hey, this is Ted, he's a good guy. You know, this, this is what he's gonna be doing. He's gonna be doing what Robert did, right? He's gonna be doing the rural outreach, but yeah, he's a good guy. Well, and, and Ted, I wonder if there was a sort of a progression of how you came to regard the people that you met out on the flats. And maybe you went in with some ideas like, uh, you know, these people are yeah. a, a little different, but then you, you developed relationships, and I would guess that maybe things changed over time for you. Well, they did, and I, I think um, a lot of us, everybody actually, not just <clears throat> the media class, but everybody, including people out on the flats, navigate life with the help of some stereotypes. And um, one of the ones I came to the valley with was um, uh, I, I thought I'd meet r more rednecks. I thought there will be rednecks here. And that's who I'm going to have to manage. <clears throat> People who <clears throat> mock my views on gun control or Hillary Clinton. Uh, I thought that's what I'm gonna have to manage. And I thought there'll be a lot of Trumpers and I'll have to manage that. But in fact, people, it's such, there's such a variety of people. There's plenty of supporters of former President Trump um, but I hadn't expected to meet a bunch of them who are total potheads, uh, <laughs> you know? That, so that, there's a stereotype right there that went away. Like a yeah. guy actually c trying to cure his cancer through THC enemas. <laughs> you, there are lots of people like this, actually, and, um, <laughs> well, at least a few. And, uh, And this guy, yeah, if he had ever taken a moment to ask about me, we, we might have had some problems. But he wasn't at all interested in asking about me. He just wanted to tell me how he, how he thought. And I have a number of neighbors like that who are just happy to tell me what they think. But I have others who, um, who yeah, are curious about what I think. Sometimes they ask what I think of them. Um, uh, what other surprises? Oh, the th second or third person you introduced me to, Paul, said, hi, Ted, I'm Paul, I'm gay. <laughs> and uh, that was the first gay person I've ever met who introduced himself that way. <laughs> and, um, and he would today if we went there. I actually, uh, <laughs> I visited Paul this week, and he was uh, shooting, hitting golf balls off of his neighbor's one hole golf course. Um, <clears throat> you have lots of land out there, and uh, the neighbor told me his only challenge is that the pack rats collect the golf balls before he can get them and put them into nests with like 50 golf balls. So I, that story just made me happy all day. I love, and he said, he said ravens can actually lift golf balls and fly away with them. So see, you don't know that, do you, no, living I, here? I, no. I learned something today, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I'd like to talk just a little bit um, about your, your craft and kind of the, the way uh, you approach your books in, in general, not just uh, Chiefland, Colorado. Um, it's, I think being called slow journalism, immersion. Um, I, how do you describe and define what it is you do? Because all those yeah. books have that in common. Yeah, so uh, those terms work. I, I write narrative journalism. I look for a story I can tell. I like the first person. I think it helps me be transparent about what's going on so the reader isn't guessing about this person telling the story. Um, I admit to 
ignorance and frailty. I admit to, to being lonely out there and needing to go into town by every second or third day because uh, I, I need people. I don't do well in isolation like you have out there, but it, for a couple days, it's okay. Um, I studied anthropology as an undergraduate and um, thought that in, in that model, there is a way to write a deeper journalism. So to go by, to go past the five W's that were taught in school, um, and to, to taking things in through your senses and through your own reaction to things, whether it's the cold or whether it's the gun found by the teenager helping me clean out the mobile home that came with my land. He, I was at the other end of the trailer. He was picking up old clothes, and he goes, ah! And uh, I said, I thought he had found a snake or something, and he, he was holding a, a little pistol, a Derringer, uh, which the former owner had left under a mattress. And, uh, and it was loaded. And, um, and we later found a shotgun that was also loaded. This place was just a, a pack rats uh, warren with, with no golf balls, but guns and lots of other stuff. Uh, so I, I guess I try to, yeah, create a document that's it's ethnographic, but it's not tendentious. Even that word, I'm sorry to use the word, a tendentious word like that. I want to write a thing that's uh, accessible to people uh, who are not uh, college or university people. I want it to be uh, simple language that tells an important story that uh, might be lost if nobody were there to um, soak it up. So, Tona, you saw what he was doing. You saw how he was going about it. Did, did you worry about him? You, I mean, you know how unforgiving the flats can be just in terms of the elements, uh, not to mention some of the folks out there. But did, did you worry about Ted uh, as to whether he'd be able to pull this off? I did. I think um, <clears throat> even, even myself going out there again to do this count this year, you know, you could pull up to a place and, and someone could come out and not, and not want you there. And, and, you know, people have weapons and those types of things. So I was concerned um, a lot for his safety. Um, I wasn't concerned that he would be able to, you know, write, write the book and, and do what he did. But there, there are a lot of concerns out there. You know, there, there's um, places where you can, you know, get stuck. And if you didn't have a way to get yourself out of there, you could you know, potentially freeze to death, those types of things. So, you know, people have um, frozen to death out there. So I was concerned about some of those things, his safety. Um, I think I didn't know how people would react to him and if they would be willing to open up and talk with him and give him, you know, give him what he wanted for his story. Um, we kept in pretty constant contact, I think. Uh, he came in to town and would come by the shelter and we'd talk. Um, sometimes text or call. So um, it was it was touch and go for a little while. I think after you know after he had been at it for you know the first few months, I felt pretty confident that he had kind of broken in and, and had um, you know some people that trusted him and that he trusted, and that if he got into a, si a sticky situation, that you know there were people out there to help. And then of course no, we would be willing to come out and help him too if he needed that. So. But uh, Tona also knows all kinds of things that I didn't know, like really how to know if somebody's using meth, uh, which a lot of people who come to the shelter sometimes have done. And uh, I remember, yeah, you showed me a, a security camera of a person on the roof one night holding something. And the way they held it, you just you knew it was a, a pipe for meth. And I said, well, how do you know that? And he said, well, look at it, the way they turn it on the side to get all of it out. And how would I know that? Um, <clears throat> Tona knows everything. Um, <laughs> and uh, or, or just the, the organization she worked for, La Puente, models this kind of non-judgmental uh, interaction with people. <clears throat> it's, it's even, that's not, it's it's not simply non-judgmental. It's it's advocacy. It's like uh, uh, you, 
Tone has had to deal with so many difficult people who disrespect her, who in fact, one day I was there, stole the keys to her SUV um, uh, and took it to Colorado Springs to a court date on charges of grand theft auto, if I <laughs> recall. <laughs> So knuckleheads and ne'er-do-wells and people who are not nice, most of them men, but not all. And Tona is just a tower of strength and composure who, who can handle it. And I thought, I, I thought, I want to be like you. Because <laughs> I, I taste despite my best efforts, sometimes people get to me. It, it, it can feel personal kind of quick if somebody decides they want to, uh, you know, be a bother. And you just, but La Puente is full of people who know how to handle that. Well, Tona, uh, you've read the book. Um, 30 second review here. What, what did you think? Oh, now we're in trouble. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I think I think it, he captured the spirit of it. I think the stories that he was able to get um, uh, that I would have never been able to know about some of the people here was awesome. I think um, I think that he did well by the Grubers and that he was able to tell their story in a way that um, you know that honored them. But I, altogether, I, I thought it was a great book. I think he. Um, I hadn't read any of his books before. Um, I did read New Jack when he was writing this one, so I kind of got an idea of, of how he, of how he went about it. But I, th I think it's a great book. I think um, it made me laugh. It made me cry. Um, but it, you know, it, it told the story. And um, so, can so we just tell everybody? I have never heard your review of my book until now. This is the <laughs> truth. Uh, Tona was invited. I didn't know Kevin was going to ask a question like that. Thank you. Okay. Can we well, move on to other things, <laughs> Kevin? <laughs> well, Ted, be, before we get to questions, I, I uh, want to come back to um, telling this story compared to other stories that you've told. It seems like the previous books, they had a definite start uh, and an end point to this. D does Chief Land Colorado or the experience that it began have an end point? Well, yes. And no, it, like my other books, it involves a person a, on a passage into an unknown place. Uh, I, a person, a narrator, I try to be relatable and I try to explain uh, what this was like and who I meet. It's first person, it's not mainly about me, but I'm, you learn a lot about me along the way. Um, and yes, other projects I have gotten off the rails. I have uh, left Aspen. I have left the employment of New York State Corrections. Um, this, you know, I'm now not going to the valley in the winter. Uh, but I'm still, this is my fourth or fifth trip uh, this summer that I'm just ending now. And uh, so it, it doesn't have the exact same arc, uh, but that's just, the, that's its organic shape. That's how it is. And um, uh, you kind of have to bow to the story and see where it takes you. And right now I'm still going out there and um, still glad to have it in, in my life. Uh, uh, yeah. So what would you like people to take away from this? Hmm. I guess that um, I think if you are aware of the stigma that certain people carry, you can treat them better. If you know that a lot of people uh, in town feel bad about who they are or who their clothes suggest they might be or their appearance, and there's plenty in city life as well as out on the flats. Um, uh, no, I think awareness of that view of the world uh, can help us uh, create a better world, a better Colorado. I think um, uh, it's funny out there. I'm always uh, having trouble 
connecting with people on foot on Bronco Sundays, uh, and it's because uh, there are uh, so many Bronco fans out there. Uh, am I right? I think yeah. one might be next to me here. Um, <laughs> and uh, when you're driving down 159 from Fort Garland to uh, you know Taos or Santa Fe, and you look out and you see the forlorn trailer, you might think I don't have much in common with those people, but I kind of think we do. And uh, the other thing is, I just I think the existence of this option for living um, off grid, very little money, is uh, is kind of a great thing. It's a uh, it keeps alive a dream of ownership. It, it creates a through line from homesteaders of a century ago and a sort of frontier spirit that yes, if you work hard, you can make a life for yourself here. You can do it with your own uh, gumption and, and sweat. And, um, and yeah, the, the federal government has came, came after some of these subdividers back in the 70s and said, this is a scam. This is like a Florida land scam because you've represented this is a good investment and it's not. The, the land's not gonna appreciate. You're not gonna be able to sell it. You, can, you should be able to get your money back. And I was amazed to discover that few people wanted their money back. They, they liked having land. They liked that, having that in their life. And um, I think it's uh, in an in a era when we're having trouble providing housing for all the people here, and making places affordable, um, this is not a bad uh, option to have. Well, on that note, we'd like to open up for questions. Uh, if anybody has a question, Olivia, do you have the microphone? Or? Okay. Yeah, VAR online. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I live in Paonia in Delta County, so all of this sounds very familiar. And we are dealing with a big land use code struggle right now. So my question is, and you mentioned that there are two different counties that are affected by the flats. What are the existing land use codes and is there discussion about updating those to, you know, push some of these folks out or make it safer, or anything like that? And then. Second question is um, Tona. Um, I am an activist that's dealt with a lot of burnout, so just I'm curious what your uh, practices are for maintaining resilience and compassion. Okay, I could speak to the first one. I think Ted might be able to speak to that as well. So um, the counties are Alamosa County and Costilla County. I think Alamosa County, from what I understand, they're a little bit more lax and, and willing to work with people on on the uh, with their land use. They they have some programs where people can be able to stay on the land in their campers and those types of things. And and um, so I think that seems to work well for some of the people in that county. In Costilla County, like I said, the the, the, the people who had settled there, the people in San Luis, they they didn't really want the you know, people on the flats. And so they were very strict with their land use. And there was a time there where, you know, the code enforcement officers were going out and, you know, removing people. They were giving them a certain amount of time. And if they didn't, they were taking their land. Um, they had to have, you know, driveways built and all these things. I think, I think that feud has kind of died down. But um, initially, uh, when the land was sold, it was sold as you can live in your camper on your land, you can stay there for as long as you want, like that's that's what you can do. And so these people came out there thinking that they could, you know, live in their campers and, and work on their property as they saw fit and then that changed. So there's there's been some maybe you can talk a little bit more about it. I don't I Yeah, think. yeah. About seven years ago is when Costilla County had a big crackdown on people who didn't have septic systems. Even people who'd lived there maybe 10 or 15 years with an outhouse were told they had uh, a month to get a septic system put in or face fines of $50 a day. And that just resulted in a big depopulation, actually, of, uh, of off-gridders who were terrified of running afoul of the law and couldn't put together the money for a septic system that quickly. Is it a good idea to have a septic system? Yes, it really is a good idea. Um, but 
uh, I think you need to work with people, like you said. And um, uh, I think in four, I think counties absolutely should have zoning codes and enforcement of their codes, but uh, rigidity is, is a bad way to, to approach this. Um, and it's funny, too. Even in Castilla, you can't now put a tiny house on your land. It has you, to be a certain uh, It needs to be six, 600 square feet for whatever reason. Uh, I asked the county manager about that. He said, that's not very big. And I said, no, but it's a lot bigger than a tiny house. Right. And uh, I think certain ideas take a while to filter out there. Com com composting toilets ought to be OK in certain situations. And uh, anyway, it's a long discussion. Uh, Ongoing discussion. Yeah. Do you want to address how you were able to stay the director of the shelter for so many years? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I think that, that you have to have the heart. You have to be able to say, this is this is my calling. This is what I want to do. Obviously, I'm not there anymore. So I, I had to come to a point where I, you know, made that decision, I think. Um, but, but I think for me, it was trying to separate, you know, my home life from my work life, which was hard because I was on call every single day for all of the 15 years that I worked there, but really relishing in the time that I was able to spend away from work, enjoying, you know, what was around me. Um, I always had to keep in mind, you know, uh, grace. Um, I, I don't know what someone's going through, so I'm not in a position to be able to really judge anything about anyone. My, my position was to help, and so, you know, as much as I could help, that's what I did. Um, faith. That's one of the things. Um, and having, having those outside hobbies and interests, um, I think that really helps a lot. And then just, just reminding yourself of what it is that you're doing and why you're doing it. Um, even when those times are stressful, you know, that, okay, I may, I always, <clears throat> my AmeriCorps members that would come to work for me would always, I would ask them about, you know, service and, um, Sometimes they had these big ideas. They were going to end homelessness. They were going to change the world. But I always use the, the story of the starfish, right? This, this, this gentleman's walking on the beach, and this guy's throwing these starfish back into the ocean. And there's thousands of them that have washed up. And um, he said, what are you doing? And he says, well, I'm putting this starfish back in the ocean. And he said, well, how, how can you make a difference? There's so many of them. And so the gentleman picks one up and throws it in the ocean and says, I made a difference to that one. And so for me to keep in perspective, into perspective that um, even if I was doing something small, that I was still making a difference to some people, I think that motivated me as well. Um, Ted, I'm wondering, was there a point where you knew you had the story? Or some experience that said, oh, okay, this is gonna, this is gonna work, or I've really got a great foundation for it. Yeah, it's funny, you know, one convention for first person nonfiction books like this is you spend a year, right? I spend a year as a prison officer. That makes sense until you realize you don't have a book yet. And, and then I spent five years and I thought, well, I think actually I kind of do now. Uh, I've gone from feeling like a stranger to being known and recognized people who meet me for the first time suddenly re realize who I am. And um, and I've gone through cycles of people coming and going. I'm now, I've, got, I've had more longevity than several of my neighbors at this point. So I was waiting for just a, a moment of, uh, yeah, perspective and where I could uh, take the story out of me and, and, and put it on the page. And uh, I'm not, all, I'm not, to me, it's not simply filling out an outline. It's some sense of this thing has percolated or, uh, you know, matured somehow, and now I can, now I can see. Here's where it will go, and it just it just takes trial and error, uh, and a sort of hunch. And I've I've often fallen short and been told by uh, friends. Uh, this fellow in the very front row read my very first manuscripts about riding the freights. He's a computer scientist, and instead of long comments, he'd write a plus or a minus in the, in the margin. <laughs> so helpful. It's totally helpful. All the people give different kinds of feedback, and uh, 
if you're an aspiring writer, you seek out a variety from people you trust. And uh, I've just benefited over the years from, from good readers. I always associate San Luis Valley with northern New Mexico, almost as if that's a separate. San Luis Valley is really part of northern New Mexico, and I think a lot of that is because of its heritage of Hispanics basically controlling the politics and the, the demographics. And I'm just wondering what the status now is of race relations between primarily gringos, white people, and the native population, whether there's a lot of tension, a lot of discrimination, or whether things are getting better, or just what your view is. And I'd ask that of both of you. I, I say that there, there's still tensions there. There is still that. I mean, the, this, this flats, um, <clears throat> flat story is, is really a good, is really a good uh, example of that, right? The, the people in San Luis, you know, predominantly Chicano, Hispanic people aren't, aren't really down with the people coming out uh, on the flats, the gringos, the, the people from out of town. Um, I think there's definitely still that happening. Um, I have had that happen with my own family. Um, my husband is of a different race than I am, and that was really frowned upon by my mother. You know, um, you don't you don't marry a white man, and a white man's never going to own this land. And so, you know, that has happened personally to me. I think that there are um, some people who are, who are coming around. Um, so I, I'm not sure that it was maybe what it was in the 70s, but it still is. It still is um, very prevalent, in my opinion. And I'd say it's more of an issue the closer you are to New Mexico. Uh, up, do you think up Blanca, Fort Garland, Alamosa, less less like that? No, I, I don't think that. You don't think so? Um, the most acute tension <laughs> that I've witnessed seems to be between the town of San Luis and off gridders on its rural land. Who, you know, uh, the subdivision couldn't have taken place if the county commissioners hadn't uh, approved it. But that wasn't done in a very democratic fashion. It, I think, was conceived of as a way to uh, increase tax revenue from agricultural land to supposed residential land. And, uh, and in the last 10 years, suddenly the people living off grid and paying very low taxes, very low taxes, require a lot more county services, like from the sheriff, from uh, schools, from uh, health, uh, social services. All, they really are more needy than they used to be, and that's a drain on the county. And then there's also, uh, my neighbors feel discriminated against uh, uh, by virtue of their race. And, um, and that's a really hard thing to handle. Uh, it's funny, they, they feel that way, like uh, the Grubers don't like to go into San Luis, but they, don't mind going into Antonito at all. And there's just a different vibe. And there's a different vibe everywhere, uh, depending on how things are going. Yeah. Partial ahead. answer. Absolutely. And, and when people, you know, ask me about that, I said, well, sure. I'm sure you're Spanish and came over and conquered the Aztecs, you know? I mean, <laughs> uh, that really is that you can trace your lineage yeah. all the way back to Spain, but, you know, it, it came through, through, those, through those Aztec um, you're ruins. Just, you're just asking whether that's, you should be proud of that? Is that what you're I, I'm, I'm just saying that when, you know, there, there's that, even that disconnect yeah. for, for people that they, they don't even um, acknowledge their own heritage, right? right? And so that, how, can you, how can you acknowledge anybody else's mm. race or heritage when you're in denial about your own? Yeah. Well, I think we're about out of time, but once again, I'd like to thank both Ted and, and Tona for joining us. Uh, if you don't already own Cheap Land Colorado, the book, not the land, uh, <laughs> 
We have copies available uh, downstairs near where you register, just right next door to that. And I'm sure Ted's going to be more than happy to sign. I will go there. A few. And uh, maybe Tona will hang around a little as well if anybody wants to chat further. But thank you all again for showing up. Thank you for supporting the Colorado Sun. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day at SunTech. Thank you. Thank you.